Welcome to the Holy Spirit's Curriculum of Joy podcast. My name is Juan Oberhuber, and I'm your host. My guest today is Keith Cavanaugh. Welcome. Thank you very much, Monica. So happy to have you here today. And I'm so excited to hear how you got to see the world the way you do today. Cool. Cool. Yeah, please, please describe how you got to, to seeing the world the way you do today. Okay. Um, so um, from the time I was a very young teenager, the whole area of um, spirituality, um, psychic abilities, mediumship abilities, ghosts, spirits, um, manifestation, um, reincarnation, hypnosis, all, all those areas have always been a massive passion for me. And, and I guess from the time I was that age, um, there, was this, the, there was this sort of sense that every so often I could feel God's presence in my mind. Now, that, that sounds a little bit sort of um, out there to say. Everyone does. It's, it's when you have those moments of um, where your mind falls still, uh, the normal chatter in the head just falls still because you're appreciating something. Uh, and it could be the beauty of nature or it could be a particularly beautiful spiritual book or passage that you're reading. Um, but I, I think we all have those moments where, you know, for someone it could be holding their child for the first time, um, or it could be, you know, you know, cat giving, having kittens or something like that. But something out of the ordinary that the ego kind of like doesn't really have a label for it and our mind falls still. There's this kind of like presence that arises inside of ourselves. Um, like a consciousness or an awareness, um, and it's kind of outside of thought. And, and, and I always had that awareness of that uh, from the time I was quite young. And not that it was there all the time, it wasn't. It was just that when it was there, it was something I knew was quite significant. And I sort of felt like it was the most important thing um, in life was to do something about, about that, that sense of God's presence. Um, and I mean, so much so that when I finished high school, it was my it was my goal actually to go in and study for the Catholic priesthood. Um, and I would have done that, except that they weren't prepared to take me so young. They really wanted me to go out and live my life first and come back to them. And so, if they hadn't done that, I, I would definitely have gone ahead with it. Um, so, so thankfully, that that's not the route that I took. Um, and, you know, it wasn't even that I had any great love or affinity with, um, you know, things like um, dogma or masses or anything, because I didn't. But, but I just, I was really drawn towards the idea of being there for people when they came into the world as a representation for God, uh, being there as a comfort for people in terms of connecting them with God and sort of being there when they're departing the world as a representative of God. And that just really, really appealed to me, even though. I would have had some big reservations around some of the dogma uh, within the church. But anyway, I, <clears throat> it wasn't to be the direction that I ended up going. I did go a different direction. Um, one of the things in my 20s that was quite significant for me was I did a, a sort of a course called the Silver Mind Control Method, they called it back then. I think now it's called the Silver Method. And that was quite um, formative. It was, it was basically a, um, a course and it, 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 it sort of taught you to meditate at the alpha level and to do things like curing headaches and setting goals and, um, and, and also connecting in with your psychic faculties. So that was sort of something that was quite significant. Um, the first book I read that really um, seemed to give me an answer to that presence, that sense of God's presence that I would have been aware of when I was younger. The, the book that really sort of hammered that home for me was The, the Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, because I remember reading it going, that's the thing, that's the thing, that's that sense, that's that presence that, you know, that was there, that, that, that you know, elusive um, sense of God's presence and peace in my mind. So The Power of Now was quite significant for me in that sense. Um, I think it's probably about, uh, it's close to 30 years ago since I um, first encountered the Course in Miracles. And I went to it because I heard Wayne Dyer speaking of it, because I had like books by Wayne Dyer and I had some audio tapes at the time of Wayne Dyer. And he often quoted from the Course. 
And um, that, that's what caused me to buy the course for the first time. And, and when I read it, um, gosh, I mean, the, there was just some absolutely beautiful passages in it. And, you know, passages that definitely connected you with that, that stillness, that sense of God's love and presence in your mind. Now, the book wrecked my head um, because it, it kept contradicting itself. Every time I thought I understood something, it seemed like it said the opposite. Um, some of the passages are, it's like trying to read a different language other than English. Um, so, so it kind of wrecked my head. And I, I have this weird thing. Like I'm a really bad student in the sense that when I'm studying something, I, I need to understand every little piece. Like, for example, you know, um, a good student just studies what they're studying and they just keep going and they encounter things that they don't understand and they just move past them and know they'll come back to them at some point in time and they just keep studying what they can study. I'm just not one of those people at all. And um, when I'm studying, I need everything needs to make perfect sense to me. And as soon as I encounter something I don't understand, I, I, I need to have that understood before I can move past it. It's, it's a weird thing I have. Um, and the problem with the course was that I just couldn't move past all the contradictions in it. There was just massive contradictions in it. One minute, God doesn't know that we're here. And the next minute, he's crying for his children in, in, in heaven, you know. Um, and so, um, and the course was full of those type of contradictions. And, you know, I, I remember having a, a, a notebook and I'd written down atonement and forgiveness and Holy Spirit. And I was trying to, like, get everything sort of defined and make sense. And... And it was head wrecking. And one day I literally threw it out the window because I just it melted my head. <laughs> now, in spite of all of that, I had like written out passages from the course that particularly moved me and I had them plastered around the house and I just I, I loved them. Um, <clears throat> so so I, I, in terms of the course, it was beautiful. Um, I kind of probably did half the lessons half heartedly. Um, but I kind of loved it and hated it because I just couldn't really make a complete sense of it. Um, and, and all the while I was reading other spiritual, um, you know, material as well. And then kind of in my 30s, I had a sort of a delayed adolescence. And these were my crazy, debaucherous years. And I did so much partying and raving and life was just crazy for almost a decade, <laughs> dysfunctional relationships. Um, and that pretty much distracted me mostly from my spiritual path. And, um, and I did feel all the way through it that this lifestyle, I was just wasting my time and I should be doing something spiritual. And I wasn't. And, um, and that one day I would. But that whole party lifestyle was like incredibly addictive and seductive in itself. So I, yeah, I pretty much knocked a, a decade out of that kind of debaucherous lifestyle. Um, and eventually it got very old and it became hollow and it became somewhat meaningless. And I decided to really throw myself back into the spirituality side um, again. And at that point, I even considered becoming a priest again. But no, I didn't do it then either. Um, so I started attending group meditations um, four times a week. And when I read Gary Renard's book, The Disappearance of the Universe, it massively reignited my interest in the course. Now, it did massively ignite my interest in the course, but I was a bliss ninny course student. It was like the course, the course is great. God loves us all. Everything is love and light. It's fabulous. We have the Holy Spirit in our minds. Um, but, you know, the God's honest truth is that the whole forgiveness thing, I was crap at that. I was, um, <laughs> you know, it was a half-hearted effort at best to even try and implement this. And I was constantly changing my forgiveness formulas and trying to tweak them and going, this is the one that I am going to use. And um, I didn't really know what the hell I was doing. I, I, I thought the forgiveness process was that I had to choose against my ego and I had to choose the Holy Spirit against the ego. And, um, and that meant dropping, you know, dropping my grievance completely and saying everything was love and light. And I, I wasn't prepared to do that. And I didn't really think God had any sort of right to expect it from me. 
um, most of the time in terms of what I was supposed to be forgiven. So look, the forgiveness thing, I was never great at that. Uh, I mean, looking back now, I hadn't a clue what practicing the course meant, but I did love it. Like, you know, Gary's book really brought back the love of the course and the love of the ideas of the course and, 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 and that. Um, but, but in terms of where the rubber meets the road, there wasn't a lot happening on the forgiveness side of things. I was kind of conveniently putting that aside as a big part of the course. Um, and so I, so I was doing this meditation uh, four times a week um, and I was doing, you know, um, psychic development and various different things as well. So I was really throwing myself back into the area. And, and then there was, um, I had this like weird sense when I was meditating one day that there was like an anxiety there. Now it was nothing overwhelming or debilitating, but it was a sense of an anxiety. And it was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and then every once in a while while I was meditating, I would get that sense of anxiety. Um, and again, it's not something I pay too much attention to. Um, I, 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 it's something I've, I've researched since. And, uh, you know, quite a lot of people who meditate, like somewhere around, uh, you know, there's three different studies and some say 7%, some say 12%, and some put it higher. Um, in terms of, you know, how things like meditation and mindfulness can actually bring on anxiety. Um, now, I had a crazy lifestyle, so I can't necessarily blame the, the, the meditation in the situation uh, or whether it was a combination of both. I just think it's interesting that the anxiety sort of manifests itself whilst I was meditating. And, and then, um, then everything seemed to fall apart. I suddenly had conflict in my home and my work life. I had um, a lot of health problems. Uh, the meditation school I was going to was actually closing. And also the relationship I was in with a Brazilian at the time was coming to an end because his studies were finishing in the country. And, and all of a sudden I was hit with this frightening, debilitating, ceaseless anxiety. Um, it, it was nothing like I'd ever experienced in my whole life. Uh, the panic attacks were terrifying. I ended up in the ER a few times, convinced I was going to have a heart attack. Um, I, I would have had what sort of felt like mini seizures where there was like electricity shooting into my brain. And, and there was like body numbness. And, um, you know, it, it led me to go and have um, scans done to see if there was something wrong with my brain or something like that. Um, and I mean, there wasn't. I mean, it was anxiety, but it was just so hard to believe that anxiety could be such a a physical thing. Um, I would have body numbness. I, I, I couldn't sit still without shaking my leg because it, it felt like if I didn't do that, I would explode. It was like all that anxiety inside of me would just like explode. Um, I, I had to actually learn how to fall asleep shaking my leg like that because um, again, there was just no comfort or ability to maintain a situation where I wasn't doing that. Uh, and I would have to sleep pressing my thumb or my fist into my solar plexus. And that was to distract me from my heart palpitations, where my heart kept sort of like having an irregular beat. Um, and I had that relentless anxiety from the moment I woke up in the morning until exhaustion finally let me sleep at night. Um, and even when I was sleeping at nighttime, it would take like 20 or 30 false starts because each time I would fall asleep, my body would literally jump in the bed like I was having a heart attack and wake me up again. And, and I used to have to go through that maybe 20 or 30 times before exhaustion kept me asleep. So my, life pretty much became that for four years. I had zero social life. I put on a massive amount of weight and became obese. Um, I could do nothing apart from go to work, sort of scrape through the day on a knife edge of anxiety, and, and finally just go home and lock myself in the house and try and distract myself and, and eat. Um, it was utter hell. I, I, I mean, I, you know, it's only when you have something like that happen um, that, that, that you realize what, what that's like. I mean, you know, it was such a lonely, I, I, okay, there's, there's a lot of things you could say about anxiety. It's exhausting. That's the first thing nobody realizes about anxiety. It's utterly exhausting. And the second thing is that, you know, everyone wants to say to you, well, listen, your life is going fine and you just need to think positive and you just need to, like, get yourself going and you need to, like, stop worrying. And, and if only if it was that simple. And, and I would have said that to people with anxiety before I ended up with it. 
So, I mean, it wasn't like I can hold that against anyone. It's, it's, it's the same ignorance I would have had. But my God, it was just, um, it was hell and it was lonely and it was frightening. I just felt like his life going to be like this forever. And then uh, my Brazilian partner actually came back from Brazil and we got married. And that forced me out of myself somewhat and I re-engaged with life more. We, we joined a gym and I lost over 20 kilos, which is 45 pounds for any American listeners. And um, so, so that was me kind of like re-engaging with life somewhat. The anxiety was still utterly relentless and it was there from first thing in the morning until last thing at night. But I, I, I did at least start living a semblance of a life again. And I was grateful for that much for a while. And then there came a point where I really had to take stock and be honest with myself and say, this is as good as it gets. Um, you know, this half-life um, whereby you're living a semblance of a life and you're sort of like scraping through your day and you just have this anxiety in your head all the time. Is this it? Is this it forever? Is this it until until you die? And, and, and again, all, all the time, you know, one of the worst things about the anxiety years was that I couldn't even meditate because if I tried to meditate the same thing would happen to me that happened to me when I was trying to sleep which was that my body would just literally jump like I was having a heart attack um, as soon as I closed my eyes for like three seconds or four seconds. Um, so, so really yeah I was taking stock again and really looking at what my life was and going you know very much like like Bill in his famous speech to Helen, it was pretty much, there has to be another way. This can't be it forever. Um, so it was, let's go back to spirituality. And I pretty much knew the course was the most profound thing I'd ever read. And I, I pretty much knew it was, it was what I should do. And if I was gonna do it, I was gonna have to understand it. And that meant going to Kenneth Wapnick. And I pretty much, my, my life was quite busy with my, like I worked six days a week and I would have had, um, you know, I would have been getting up early in the morning and going to the gym before I work out and doing a day's work and coming home and maybe spending an hour or two watching television with my partner before bed. There, there was a limited amount of time there for reading. And so I decided I was going to use audiobooks and um, Ken's workshops. And so I bought a whole load of them. And I simply decided that this was it. I was going to throw myself wholeheartedly into the course. I was going to understand it if it killed me and I was going to practice it if it killed me. And so um, I would, you know, uh, between walking to the gym and walking home from work and between being in the gym, I could listen to Ken for like two and a half, three hours a day. And that's exactly what I started doing. And I started to understand the course in a completely different way. Um, you know, I, I learned that forgiveness is being the observer of your ego with Jesus. It wasn't about choosing against uh, the ego's interpretation and picking the Holy Spirit's interpretation. It wasn't about that. It was simply about um, sitting in the cinema with Jesus, watching your ego and watching the world and not judging it, doing it non-judgmentally. So, the way Ken was teaching it was the you that can watch is not the you that's watched. So the capital S self watches with Jesus once you're watching without judgment. Um, and it's the small s self that's actually observed. And, and this very much so, um, you know, brought the Course in Miracles into line with what other teachers were saying, like Eckhart Tolle. Uh, which was like, you know, being present with what is and, you know, allowing and not judging. Um, so, so with Ken's understanding, it's about connecting with that light and peace of the Holy Spirit. And you look at your ego's darkness and fear without judging it, uh, without changing it, without fighting it, without trying to fix it, without doing anything. You simply, you go towards the light, which is that place of love and peace in your mind, and you look at the darkness. And, and that's pretty much what I did um, all day. I, I joined with Jesus as a place of peace in my mind. And I looked at my anxiety and I regularly asked myself, what does the anxiety have to do with the peace and love of the Holy Spirit in my mind? Um, what does movie Keith and his ridiculous fears and anxieties, uh, what does that have to do with what I am here watching it with Jesus? 
Now, in the beginning, my sense of that peace and love of Jesus in my mind was was somewhat vague and nebulous, um, but I persisted with it. I, I, I really just locked into my mind the idea that that's what's true. And even if that love and peace is something I'm more remembering from my teenage years than something that I'm experiencing, I, I knew it was real. And I just said, that's what, what's real. And everything else in my mind is not. Um, and, and I listened to, to Ken for hours a day. And I, I, I tried to cultivate the practice of listening to Ken and having the Holy Spirit or Jesus in my mind at the same time. So I was, I was aware of what, what, what I was learning, what was going on. Uh, and I was doing that with the Holy Spirit and with, 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 with Jesus, it's the same thing. And, and obviously the hard part about that is holding the Holy Spirit in your mind, because um, the, the, you know, the ego wants to drag us off on our thought streams and away from the presence. Um, so so it, it's just a matter of noticing when you've, when you've gone off in a thought stream and bringing yourself back to the, that sense of the Holy Spirit's presence in your mind with whatever that you're doing. And, and and listening to Ken for three hours a day, I mean, it, it was great because, because the material itself was spiritual and about the Holy Spirit and about Jesus and about the Course. It, it was such a great, you know, even though you go off on a thought stream and you lose that connection, <clears throat> it would bring you back to it. And, and, you know, thinking back now, that was such amazing training for just holding that presence in my mind. Um, so, so that's what I kind of did. Um, and I would just watch with that presence of Jesus in my mind, the racing anxiety thoughts and the fear. And, and would just regularly say to myself, what does that have to do with the love and peace of the Holy Spirit in my mind? And after months of this, my awareness of the presence of love and peace of Jesus in my mind became stronger. So it wasn't as vague and nebulous anymore. There was a sense of that peace there and, 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 and it had grown. And, and, and there was an inkling of that sense of love that, that, that was there as well, somewhat sporadically, but the peace was becoming quite, um, quite consistent. So um, I, I persisted with that. And a few months later, I noticed that my anxiety was like substantially reduced. And it was interesting to sort of see that it wasn't so much that you know, Keith was getting better or Keith was doing anything different. It was more so that that sense of the Holy Spirit's presence in my mind had had sort of like become bigger or had like sort of taken ground back from where all the fear and anxiety and racing thoughts were before. And so it, it was almost like um, one was getting replaced with another. Um, and, I, you know, I got to the point where I no longer had constant racing thoughts in my mind for the first time in nearly a decade and that was an incredible um it was an incredible thing to realize because i i really never thought i would be without that ever again there was this peace in my mind that had been gone for such a long period of time and i, I and again I, I persisted with it um and 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 that sense you know did become stronger of that love and and, and then sometimes where i'd be like you know as I practiced, and, uh, and, and I, I really was quite diligent about doing this during the daytime, and, you know, as well as, you know, having the Holy Spirit's presence in my mind when I was listening to Ken. Ken is awesome. I mean, if anyone hasn't encountered Ken, just, you know, spend all your money on Ken's workshops. It's, he's just oh, an, an astounding um, intellect and had such a oh, profound understanding of the Course. But, um, so, so as well as listening to Ken and having that sense of the Holy Spirit, I, I did cultivate this idea that whatever I did, I would try and do it with the Holy Spirit. So if I was eating, that I would do it with the Holy Spirit in my mind. Um, or if I was walking, I would, I would do it with the Holy Spirit in my mind, that I would just try and hold that sense of the Holy Spirit. And I would observe my ego and observe my ego actions and observe what my ego's body was doing. And, and, and that just really made the... That, that, that sense of, you know, peace in my mind more profound. And, and then there was experiences of love within the peace that were really, really awesome. Um, and, 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 then the, <laughs> and then there was one or two weird um, experiences I didn't understand at the time. Um, you know, one of them will forever become known as the little butter, thanks to someone in my, in my Course in Miracles group. Um, 
and and it was just that I was in a I was in a restaurant uh, one morning. I, I decided to treat myself to a full breakfast. So uh, that's a thing, a thing in Ireland and England we call it a, a full breakfast, which is like you know bacon and sausages and eggs and toast. So anyway, I decided to treat myself to a proper breakfast one morning after the gym, and I had been listening to Ken obviously all throughout my workout and on the journey to the gym, and. Um, and I sat down, you know, I, I had been walking with the Holy Spirit. I had opened the door of the restaurant with the Holy Spirit. I had sat down with the Holy Spirit. I had given my orders to the waiter with the Holy Spirit presence in my mind. So there was this sense of being the witness to what it is that I was doing. Um, and and, and I, that, that, you know, that, that felt pretty good. And, and then when, I, when I had the breakfast, I, um, I again, I... Um, there was one of these individual portions of butter where you have to like unwrap it with the um, uh, the foil wrapper. And uh, when I opened it, it was like there was a light effect. Now it, it wasn't lit up butter. It was like the, it was like the light looked different around it. And, and this is something that I had started to notice. This was another weird thing I started to notice more recently was that when I connected with the Holy Spirit, it was a bit like the light looked different in the room. Um, and that had been going on for about. I don't know, three weeks, three weeks, maybe four weeks. And um, and it was just something I'd noticed. And, and and it did make me wonder, is that what Jesus means by like the light effects that he mentions in the early workbook lessons? But anyway, it, it would just sometimes feel like someone had just turned the dimmer switch up a notch or, um, or, or like things went from standard definition into high definition. It was just, it was like a kind of a, a shift that was noticeable. Um, well, I mean, that's what happened with the butter. So it wasn't lit up butter um, the way it's become christened, but there was just this sense that someone had put the, the, the um, and, and I burst into tears. And there was this, it, it was like the butter was love itself. And it was like, I don't know if you remember, you know, in Men in Black, where they, they hold up like the, <laughs> the, the flashy thing that takes away memories. It was a bit like that experience. And there was no flash. There wasn't a little butter, but it was like it did something to my mind. And it was like that was love and it hit me. And suddenly I was weeping in the restaurant that that um, everything I ever thought in my life was wrong. Everything I ever thought happened was wrong. Everything I ever believed was wrong. This love was the only thing in, that was ever happening anywhere. And um and, and it was the most, it was the most incredible experience. And then I had to pull myself together because, like, I was in a restaurant with everyone looking at this guy, like, weeping profusely at the table. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I, I didn't understand that for a long time. I, I, I sort of wondered, okay, was the butter a symbol? Um, you know, in, 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 when I would connect with the Holy Spirit in my mind, um, it, my sense was that's extension. I went, no, that's crap no that's that that's arrogant that's not what was happening um that that doesn't seem no no that couldn't be right so i actually wrote off to a course author called ms cronkite and she says yeah she says i would call those um oneness experiences or higher miracles it's it, it is extension it's when your love your, your mind fills up with love and that gets extended out to what appears to be happening in the dream and and then you experience it there um, so, I, so that made that, that made sense. Uh, no, I'm not having those experiences all the time. <laughs> there was another time it happened, getting out of the shower, and I glanced at my hand, and it was the same thing. Um, and, and they, you know, if I never have another one of those experiences, that that will stay with me for the rest of my life and sustain me. Um, but uh, but but please don't think I'm you know going around having those experiences all the time because I'm definitely not. Um, but um, so. So I, look, I, I was without the anxiety. I had this ex, this sense of love in my mind. Now, again, not all the time, but just when it was there, it was so profound. And I was learning to have this sort of presence in my mind, um, you know, during the daytime, most, most, of the, most, most of the time during the day. I mean, probably I had worked it up from about 5% of the time having that presence in my mind. And I had worked it up to maybe 40, 50% or something like that. Um, so... So really, I, I mean, it, you know, it was it was an incredible thing, like in the space of some months to to be without the anxiety and to have that sense of that that elusive, you know, God's presence, which I now knew was the Holy Spirit or Jesus back in my mind. Um, it, it was amazing. And then and then there were more weird experiences happened because I um I I remember I again, I, I mean, I. 
I had commented um, on um, uh, a post on the Foundation for Inner Peace um, uh, Facebook page. And because um, my understanding of the course was really quite good at this stage and, and, and only because of Kenneth Watnick, because I was listening to him for like three hours a day and reading him before I went to, to sleep. I had just utterly immersed myself in Ken's teachings. Um, and um, so I, I remember I put a comment on a post on the, on the page and, and, and this uh, lovely guy called Vinny um, asked me to join his course group because um, uh, it, it, it's called, um, what does a course in miracles mean when it says? And he, he just appreciated that I had quoted Ken and he says, you know, we really use Ken as, you know, our, our, our great inspiration in, in, in the course group and we go by what he says i think you'll like it and and the, the the weird thing was that whilst i had anxiety i had actually left all of the facebook groups i was in because it was way too stressful for me um to engage on social media it, it was it was it would really exacerbate my anxiety terribly and and specifically in the course groups there was like a weird phase um in in the course groups going back a number of years ago where and there was this fashion of like, um, which thankfully seems to have gone out of vogue, but there was this fashion of like sort of, you know, knocking every other spirituality going because, you know, the course is what saves people time. And, you know, we're not being judgmental. We're saving people time by knocking every other spiritual path. And that never sat right with me. That, and and, 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 um, and I had left them all because engaging in that kind of thing was stressful. So uh, I, I kind of contemplated this invitation to join the group and sort of, was very 50-50 on it. Like, I don't know if I'm ready to go back to that. But um, anyway, I did. And I was so pleased I did. It's a lovely group and Vinny's a lovely guy. And um, and then I posted in the group. And then another lovely guy called Lloyd from uh, Course in Miracles Support Facebook group. Uh, he he wanted to like sort of repost my some of my things that I've written in his group. Um, so he did that and I ended up joining his group. And um, and continue to post there. And then, you know, Lloyd asked me to come on and be like a guest speaker on his um, on his Miracle Monday show. And um, and and yeah, so initially, I was like, "Dear God, no!" Um, and then I went, "No, I'll do it." And um, and I did. And there was there was a really phenomenal response to it. And um, now, listen, there's only a phenomenal response to it because I had listened to so much of Kent Wapnick, and that's why I understood the course. I, I, one of the things that um, I really wanted to get my head around was all the contradictions around what it meant to hear the Holy Spirit and get guidance, because there's massive contradictions in the course about it. And, and, and Ken is just brilliant the way he explains all the contradictions, Jesus speaking on different levels to us. Um, and so, so I was able to but do, do quite a good talk on, you know, uh, what it means to connect with the Holy Spirit and hear the Holy Spirit, exactly, simply because I had studied Ken so much. And, 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 and the response was awesome. It really, really was. Um, I, I think that's had nearly 2,000 views at this stage. And, um, and, then, and then people started asking me to have, like, um, Zoom meetings and, you know, um, <laughs> teachings and more teachings and that was not what I was that was not what I saw myself doing that was never what I saw myself doing um but and then then Lloyd asked me back to do um a second talk and and I did that on the true forgiveness process and it had a, it had a really great response as well and 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 I had about um I think he ended up with like 39 private messages from people going please 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 do zoom meetings please 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 do do you know do this that and the other so i went okay right look no. um i can't argue with everything <laughs> um it's almost like i never i never considered myself a teacher in the slightest but it was like the whole world told me i was <laughs> and um so we did after that second talk i started up a group called of course miracles with keith and um, it, it's only up and running about three weeks and we have about 500 members in it at the moment and it's been great. There is just such some, there's, there's an amazing bunch of people there. I would say there's a core group of maybe 60, 65 people and their, their enthusiasm and their energy and their passion for the course is just absolutely inspiring. Um, every so often my, my ego just haunts me with the idea that it's just one big vanity project to myself. What the hell, who do I think I am? And what the hell do I think I'm doing? And, and the only sort of saving grace is that I'm learning so much from doing it. I mean, um, I'm growing so much from doing it. 
and um and even content that members are putting up i'm learning all the time it's just it's just been a brilliant sort of experience but but it, really what i've had is like a, a whirlwind sort of 12 months in terms of um in terms of the course of miracles so that pretty much brings us up to the present day wanaco Thank you so much. That's great. And we, we have some more background <laughs> to, to how it came to, came to this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, what a journey from, and four years of anxiety. That's, that's a lot of time. Yeah, that was how to, long ago. Yeah. That's amazing. And that you were able to go to work anyways, right? And do all I, the I was, necessary yeah. things to, to come to be able to financially survive, right? Just about, just yeah. about, yeah, yeah, just about. Um, yeah, that, that was a really tough time. And that, that that sense of this is life forever was awful. So um, I, I think it's important to say, because I know um, I, I know a lot of people have anxiety. I think it's important to say that I, I, I never really set out to cure my anxiety with the course. That was never my intention. Um, and if I did, that would have been magic, not a miracle. Um, um, but what, what, what I thought, I really just thought that anxiety be damned. I, I can't be held back from the spiritual progress that I want to make in my life. And, and I did think it would give me an, an ability to maybe deal with my anxiety better. But if I had gone about it going, I'm going to use the course to cure my anxiety, I don't think it would have worked. Because again, that's magic. That's trying to fix the symptom um, instead of the cause. And so I think just by accident, I kind of did it the right way, which was, um, which was really... But what you want to do with forgiveness is, no matter what it is, you want to say, you know, that has not taken the, the, the love and the peace of the Holy Spirit from my mind. That's, that's what forgiveness is. It's like, okay, I'm sick. It, it, it hasn't taken the love and peace of the Holy Spirit from me. You know, okay, I've had a, a bereavement that hasn't taken the love and peace of the Holy Spirit from my mind. That's, that's what forgiveness is. It's going back to the love and peace and going, that's still there. Nothing real has been affected by the dream. And, and, and so I think just it's important to sort of clarify that is that I wouldn't suggest to anyone start doing the course to cure your anxiety. I might suggest to anyone start doing the course so you can connect with sort of love and peace in your mind. Um, but, 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 but again, it's, it, it's, it's not about doing the course to get rid of the anxiety. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, you had other things that you you had learned for that, like the silver mind control and things like that. Yeah, and the interesting, and they didn't work. I couldn't do them. I actually couldn't close my eyes and meditate. The, the anxiety wouldn't let me. I would just get these, my body would just jump, um, you know, three to five seconds after closing my eyes. So they were all pretty useless to me. But but just, again, it was just understanding Ken's explanation of forgiveness, which is that you are the, the non-judgmental looker at your ego uh, with Jesus. And that's that's all that's required. Um, and and that's what I did. That's what I could do, and that's what really made all the difference. Yeah, that's remarkable because even when you're going through all of that, right, to actually even be able to hold the space of of being the observer is so hard. It, it is, and I yeah, and I'm not saying I could hold it all the time. Like I say, in the beginning, it was there five percent of the time, and it was really just bolstered by listening to Ken's material in my mind, which. Even though my, you know, my my, my attention would go from from the light, um, the, the material I was listening to would, you know, remind me to go back to it. So that was just really good training for that. Um, but but again, I, I see again if I was trying to just hold, you know, a sense of light in my mind, I don't think I could have done that. It was the fact that you 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 went to the light and then you just looked at the crap. So I wasn't trying to escape from the anxiety. I wasn't trying to like, you know, find a place of silence in my mind away from the anxiety because that's not what the course is about. It was about going and connecting with the love and peace of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, and then just allowing the anxiety to be there with, with not trying to do anything with it, not trying to fix it, not trying to change it, not trying to choose against it, none of that, not trying to shout it down, but rather just being present with it and going, this has no effect on the love and peace of the Holy Spirit in my mind. That was the process. It was that simple. Yeah, that's quite a step because accepting what is 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 something that is not, not doesn't appear natural to to us, right? In many, right. many situations. Right. So yeah. so actually going from 
from to accepting what is without judging that that even that is a huge thing so <laughs> it's the, yeah it's the crucial thing it's it's the crucial aspect of the whole forgiveness process as Ken's explains it he says that you know for example i as keith i'm i'm the ego so I, i'm incapable of not judging everything i do is a judgment and a label and a concept and a thought like I, I i'm incapable of like not judging anything i have a running commentary about it all um and then what you know so so um there's the ego thought system and there's the holy spirit's thought system and and i am the decision maker you know and that's just a word for son of god dreamer of the dream but um i like ken's explanation of decision maker because i can choose the the thought system of the ego or i can choose the thought system of the holy spirit now again in the past i i thought i had to um if I was choosing the Holy Spirit, it meant I was letting go of the, all the ego judgments. I was letting go of all the ego emotions. And I had to just choose the Holy Spirit and it was all fabulous. And, and I couldn't do that. And, um, but, but listening to Ken, I realized that's not what it is. The whole forgiveness process is going back to being a decision maker. And so um, if you like, we're sitting in the cinema and we're watching what our ego is thinking and doing and believing and feeling on the screen with Jesus beside us. and and. and and the way we become the decision maker is that we we look without judgment. So the part of Keith that can look at Keith without judging him isn't Keith. Um, again, as Ken says, the self that the self that looks is not the self that's looked at. And so, really, it's just about learning to to be that awareness of all the crap that's going on. You're not trying to, you know, there's no judgment on it. There's no attempt to fix it or change it. You're allowing it to be there and you're not judging it. And that's how you join with the Holy Spirit. That's what joining with the Holy Spirit means, um, is that you become the non-judgmental awareness of your ego. And, and, and that was that's easy to do. Now, it's not easy to hold that awareness in your mind. That's something you have to work on. But I think I had an advantage in the sense that my anxiety was there all the time. So there was this you know, constant discomfort. It wasn't like my life was like good one minute and then someone comes in and destroys it. Like I had this constant anxiety and discomfort in my mind all the time. And and it was just comforting to go back to that sense of Jesus, the Holy Spirit in my mind and, and just say, you know, this doesn't matter because it doesn't affect the love and peace of Jesus in my mind. And, and the more I did that, the more I got a, a stronger sense of the love and peace of Jesus there. And, and, I, and I got this great demonstration of how forgiveness works. And it's not about choosing against your ego and choosing the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, that, that happens automatically. It happens by itself. You know, all we do is look at what's in our mind and we do that with, the, with Jesus, which means I'm doing it without judgment because if there's judgment there, I've let go of Jesus's hand and I'm back holding the ego's hand. So I, I watch exactly what's in my mind without judgment and as long as i'm looking at it without judgment that's me looking at it with jesus and really what i'm doing then is you know i'm i'm joining jesus in this non-judgmental place and i'm looking at the darkness and that will dispel the darkness it doesn't matter if it's anger or fear or anxiety or whatever else is going on if i can look at it without judgment um with jesus in the cinema uh, that's what will dispel it. And I just keep looking at it until it's dispelled. So, you know, the, the other thing that, you know, is quite important is I used to think that you just say, you, you know, you have something that's on your mind and you say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to give that over to you. And then you go off about your business and leave the Holy Spirit to do his job. And that's not how forgiveness works. <laughs> forgiveness is about joining with Jesus and looking without judgment at the darkness. And that looking without judgment is the light and it dispels the darkness. And that's that's how you do forgiveness. And it's just so powerful. Yeah, that's phenomenal. And the, the question of looking without judgment, that's that's quite a thing because yeah. we're used to judging. So, so oh, this, this, this change, so it's a habit. So to change one's yeah. habit can be quite yeah. quite a big thing to do and so this yeah. idea of of allowing things to be there um yeah i don't know exactly how you get to this place of feeling the love of of the presence of love and then looking at the 
stuff that you would judge otherwise. That yeah, is that no. is quite a quite a story because you're you're saying you you joined Holy Spirit, you joined Jesus, and then you look at things. You come to this place of peace, and then you look at things. I don't. I I think that it's it's a question. How do you even get to a place of peace to look at things? Because yeah. normally you're actually in the midst of this really absolutely you know, no and, and let me going on in your life yeah and, and I've, I've, I've i've had to i've had to uh, clarify this a number of times in, in different situations and i'm glad you gave me the opportunity to clarify here um um it was because it only came up in the group the other day when i'm working on forgiveness like on monday i had a massive forgiveness lesson to work on and it brought up huge it was almost like my anxiety was back it was so bad and and i had to i had to watch it all day with um with jesus in my mind and and it took me 24 hours to clear it um and um and 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 so the god's honest truth is like you know what, what what's easy to connect with is that sense of stillness in your mind that sense of peace in your mind when you're in the height of it in terms of like your you know the sewage in your mind uh, your guilt coming up um um, you, I am not feeling that, you know, intense love of Jesus in my mind at that time. I, 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 you know, so so it's more the sense of that stillness and that peace of the Holy Spirit that I'm sort of holding on to. Um, it's not that those waves of love are coming in whilst I'm in the middle of a forgiveness process. But but then the, the, the strange thing is, because when I got up on Tuesday, I had it cleared. A um, little bit of work first thing in the morning, then I was gone. And then I had these waves of love all day. It was almost like I got the crap out of the way. And then there was this sense of connecting with the love in a much deeper way. So, so, and, and this brings me to a really important point is that, you know, if you are practicing this course whereby you are trying to be a happy ego, uh, which is impossible, by the way, <laughs> um, it's not what the world is for. <laughs> The world's not to make you happy as an ego. It's just to give you um, people to blame for your unhappiness. But it doesn't make us happy. So that's that's what the world is. But but I I think you know especially you know a lot of people try to do the course as ho hopefully I can become a holy ego or a happy ego and this will make me a happier person and and and, and so really this forgiveness process becomes this like band aid situation. Oh I'm like feeling bad and here's how I can feel better. And and. Um, and, and I really ask anyone that's doing that to try and move to the next phase where you understand it's about, you know, building a sort of a, a personal, um, intimate relationship with Jesus or the Holy Spirit, whatever, you know, whatever form you're comfortable with and, and have it with you all the time. Because you're not going to feel that sort of like love in the, in the midst of like um, terrible grief or anger or resentment or guilt or um you, you, you're really going to have that experience of love, not when you're doing the band-aid situation with forgiveness, but but rather in, in, in you know when you are the observer with Jesus of your time with your family, or the observer with Jesus as you're reading the course, or you, you know the observer with Jesus as you are taking a walk or going in nature. That's that's when I connect with that love in such a powerful way of my life. It's not when I'm in the height of it and I'm trying to. Um, you know, um, clear something with a forgiveness process. So you you don't need you don't need to have those you know waves of supernatural love coming in for your forgiveness process. You just need to connect with that sense of stillness and peace in your mind. And 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 to really, I think it's quite important to understand that you know the world is an illusion. Like none of it's real. The, the Holy Spirit calls bullshit on the whole thing. None of it's happening. Um, and and ultimately, it's not real. And what is real? is that stillness and peace and love in your mind that's the holy spirit and so i i think for forgiveness it's really important to understand that 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 this is what's true that you really nail your colors to the mast on that and you understand this is what's true on the inside is true and the outside is not true and so i do think practicing the course really we really have to understand that that this is the truth and it's the truth that i want and i know everything else is the, is the denial of that truth and um and so, yeah, just in terms of practicing the course, I'd really say, you know, you know, really build your relationship with Jesus in, in the other times of your life, apart from when you've got to do forgiveness, because um, that, that's where you, you know, you just want to build that relationship and that sense of connection with that set place of peace and love 
uh, in your mind. That, that's the most important thing. And then, you know, you can, you can bring that experience to bear with your forgiveness opportunities when they arise. Yeah, you're, you're speaking of stillness. And, and that's, a, that's a big thing because when you're in the midst of it, stillness isn't really available. So, the, the, But it is in the background, Monaco. It is in the background. So again, I, I think it's it, it would be impossible to get rid of, um, it would be impossible to get rid of the noise in your head. It would be impossible to get rid of the moving uh, thoughts that are going on. Um, that, 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 so you couldn't have, you know, you, you couldn't suddenly have stillness without that. And that's not what it's about. Um, in, in terms of the forgiveness process and being in the cinema with Jesus, it's really about learning to be the stillness aware of the movement to be the silence aware of the noise, you know, to be the peace aware of the non-peace. So really it's it's just holding an awareness of both at the same time. And and so and and that's that's doable. That's doable. Does that make sense? Yeah, well it, it's basically deciding to be the observer, like you said. Absolutely. It, whether the observing feels peaceful or not it is not the what what matters according to what you've been explaining. What's what matters is that you're willing to observe and see see that you can observe what's Absolutely. going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Let that let that anger be there, let that guilt, let that anxiety. Um like I said on Monday I spent the whole day with that. So so that wasn't peaceful. But but I was aware of peace as I allowed my non-peace to be there. And so and that's really how forgiveness works. You go and you join with the light and you look at the darkness and and the darkness and the light can't coexist. So, you know, ultimately, like, you know, so for all day Monday, the darkness and the light was there in my mind, the noise and the stillness and um, the, the anxiety and the peace there. So that so that, you know, that that's what it was on Monday. And, and it took until Tuesday before before the, the light overcame the darkness. Before can I can I read you a, a quote from the course that's one of my favorites, Monica? Sure. Yeah. Um, so this is from chapter 14. The Holy Spirit asks of you but this. Bring to him every secret you have locked away from him. Open every door to him and bid him enter. Enter the darkness and light it away. So here's the important part. At your request, he enters gladly. He brings the light to darkness if you make the darkness open to him. But what you hide, he cannot look upon. So we've got to look at it. He sees for you, and unless you look with him, he cannot see. So this is where we can't just go, listen, Holy Spirit, I've got all this, you know, anger going on. And I'm going to give it to you and you sort it out for me and I'll come back and check on you later. It's all about this being in the cinema and looking. So um, at your request, he enters gladly. He brings the light to darkness if you make the darkness open to him. But what you hide, he cannot look upon. He sees for you. And unless you look with him, he cannot see. The vision of Christ is not for him alone, but for him with you. Bring, therefore, all your dark and secret thoughts to him and look upon them with him. He holds the light and you the darkness. They cannot coexist when both of you together look on them. Both of you together look on them. His judgment must prevail and he will give it to you as you join your perception to his. I think that's just the best explanation of forgiveness in the course. And I think it's beautiful. And it's just saying, you don't feel guilty about your darkness. You don't try and fix it. You don't try and change it. You simply join with Jesus, be aware of his peace in your mind, and you look at the darkness. And you do that for as long as it takes for the light to eliminate the darkness, because it will. And that's, that's what's being promised here. But you look until, because again, it, it's not working unless you're looking at it and you have Jesus there looking at it with you. And, and to look at it with Jesus, you must be looking at it without judgment. You're not saying this is terrible. I'm a terrible course student. I'm an awful human being. You're just simply looking at what the emotion is without judging it, 
with the awareness of Jesus, the Holy Spirit in your mind. And if you do that, the light will um, overcome the darkness. And that's what forgiveness is. So I'm going to open the floor for comments and questions. If anyone cool. has a comment or a question, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, Keith and I will continue. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we will continue. Fair enough. <laughs> no, no comments, no questions. So we've been very clear. You could be good news or bad news. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so you went through these years where you were partying and so on, and yeah. you still and you still followed. You still had in the background this idea of spirituality or wanting to go deeper. Um, I did. How did that? Um, how did that nag you in the midst of that? Because it must have been nagging in the back of your mind while you were partying yeah. and doing all these other things. Yeah, because like I'm not going to pretend I didn't have a great time. Um, like you know, there were a number of years there where it was a lot of fun. I mean, I'm lucky to still be alive at the end of it. Like you know, I'm not going to put on video of it, sort of how bad that was in terms of partying. Uh, but it wasn't good and it wasn't sustainable. Um, and 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 but but it was very um seductive and it was very addictive and it was but 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 uh, but it, it was never uh, it never had meaning or purpose and there was a sense of this is what i'm doing for now um but you know the spirituality is what i really want to do um but um so that kind of was what that was like um but yeah there was a lot of party <laughs> Very debaucherous years. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's also very important to to share these things so that one knows yeah. that that you know the birth of of this this path or the birth of of it all is is not always obvious <laughs> from the start. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I think any serious course path starts in darkness because I, I really do think you have to reach that point of 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 like Bill saying there has to be another way. You have to reach that point where you go, life's not working. It's it's not really working. Um, I. I because because the course really demands of us that we we challenge every single thought we have in our mind we you know that we challenge every single emotion that comes up inside of us and that we bring it to you know we join jesus with the light and we look at it um and um and dispel it and and so it, you know to, to really be serious about, about about a course in miracles you have to have reached a point in your life where you realize life doesn't work that it's not going to fulfill you it's not going to make you happy as as, as i said earlier on you know the, the the ego did not create the world so it could be happy it created the world so it could hide from god and it created the world so it could you know splinter itself into trillions of pieces and each individual piece could be without its unhappiness and guilt by blaming everyone else um as the guilty one and the one that's making them unhappy so that that, that was um you know it's the cost of individual individuality that we you know we threw away heaven for i think we have the cost of that was the unhappiness and the guilt and the terrible fear and um and the only solution to that was you know um create a make-believe world project ourselves into it um and be without our guilt by having other people victimize us and then we can go you're the guilty one not me but there's no happiness in that so the, the world was designed to victimize us that, that's, that's what we wanted the world for um that we will be victimized by health and by death and by um the evil bad people out there uh, and it's all scripted so we can simply have an existence without our guilt by seeing everyone else as the guilty one so so, so the, there is no happiness in life, and I think I, I, I think you have to have reached that point in your life where you really understand that you know this is as good as it gets in life. You know, it is, <laughs> the, the big human dysfunction is the seeking of happiness in the next moment. That's that's what you know Jesus calls the um, uh, the the ego's mantra. 
um, of seek and do not find. We're all saying, I'll be happy when I get these exams. I'll be happy when I get the right job. I'll be happy when I meet the right person. I'll be happy when that person treats me better. I'll be happy when we're married. I'll be happy when we have kids. I'll be happy when we're healthy, when we're older, blah, 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 blah. Everyone is saying, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when, and no one's ever happy when. Uh, and that's the nature of the world. And again, I think to really practice this course, um, um, you, you have to have reached the point where you realize that that's, that's a massive swindle that the ego is playing on all its individual fragments of, you know, seek your happiness, seek your happiness until you die. <laughs> Never having found that happiness. So yeah, go ahead, Julie, you have a comment or a question. Yes, hello. Thank you so much. I've really been um, getting a lot out of this um, conversation. <laughs> um, I love the idea of, you know, the, the self with a capital S, you know, like when we strive to be the best versions of ourselves, you know, we're in spirit. Um, I wondered if you had any suggestions about when, when we, we feel resistance, like we have this awareness somewhere, it, it, it creeps into our awareness that we need to do something different. And we make attempts to do it. We walk around doing it, but there's something that, like, we 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 it keeps. You know, maybe we take a step forward and then two steps back or something. Wondered if you have any insight on how to manage those kind of self sabotaging, yeah. make, making ourselves victims. You know. Yeah. Um. Stop trying to do anything. Only egos try. That's the mistake. If you're trying to do something, you're doing it as an ego. You're doing it as Julie. So all you ever want to do is watch Julie without judging her. The part of your mind that can watch Julie without judging her or evaluating her or labeling her or having an opinion of what it is that she's at, that, that's not Julie. That's your capital S self. That's you as the decision maker in the cinema with Jesus. Um, because, and even in terms of um, spirituality and, you know, what we should be doing and blah, 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 blah. The only thing you should be doing is aware of Jesus in your mind and doing everything with him and looking at everything with him. Don't don't get into the It's, it's a terrible trap to get into the trying uh, and the evaluating. It's, it's not how you do the course. I um I I work with I'm a psychotherapist and I work with mm -hmm. a lot of uh, people who have mental health struggles you know, serious yeah. things. And, you know, like, how do they get better? They usually get better when they start taking care of themselves. You know, when they okay. we start doing the things that makes their body feel better, like sleeping and eating and exercising and meditating, you know, like get, getting a yeah. grip on their own. I love because when you feel good, then as you're observing all these thoughts, you choose the more positive ones. If you're not taking care of yourself and you're, you're creating this, you know, unwellness in you, you, you stick with those thoughts that continue to create unwellness. Mm. Um, I don't know. So like, like, how do you help people get to this point where they can get to this high level? And it just seems to me like that's part of it. So many people have self, you know, low self-regard that they're used to feeling bad, you know, yeah. and um, I don't know, just trying to help them pull, pull up to the not, 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 I, I guess what you're saying is you do nothing. That's your answer. <laughs> you do nothing. You observe. Yeah, that's absolutely it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, t to me, it was all about the forgiveness process, which is learning to be the stillness, aware of the movement, knowing you're not the movement, to be the silence, aware of the noise, knowing you're not the noise, to be the, the peace, aware of the anxiety, knowing you're not the anxiety. But again, the crucial thing is that you let the anxiety be there. Like, you know, I, I think I think most therapists would tell you that what keeps anxiety in place is your attempts to get rid of the anxiety actually keeps it in place. Um, you know, one therapist trick for, for clients that have panic attacks is that when they feel one coming on the bus stop, that um, what they should try and do is make it the biggest panic attack that they've ever had. And then the really interesting thing about that is it short circuits the panic attack. Um, mm -hmm. it's, not it's not possible to have a panic attack by trying to do it. Um, you know, um, so, so, I mean, look, I mean, I, I don't know, have you read the psychotherapy pamphlet in the course? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, the psychotherapy um, pamphlet says that the, the, the client is cured when the therapist forgets to judge them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think you're right because it's the same thing as when somebody has a space to share their darkness and they're yeah. not judged for it. They Correct. Can... Yes. And I mean, that's that's what the forgiveness process is for us. It's we 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 plunk our darkness out on the table and we sit in the light with Jesus and we look at it without judging ourselves. We go. Yeah. So our discernment tells us it's darkness, but we're not going it's good or bad or it's right or it's wrong or I need to choose the Holy Spirit instead of this. That's the mistake. All you want to do is you want to look at your ego. You see, at, at, at the very beginning, um, Jesus tells us, into eternity, for all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. And so the forgiveness process is whereby we look at the what we think is the awfulness and the sewage and the murderous thoughts and, 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 and everything that's horrible in our minds and we actually go up into Jesus' light and we look at it with him and he teaches us that this is this is this is nothing let's laugh at it um you know the big laugh is that you as the son of god um could ever have known yourself to be anything other than loved and loving and joyous um um you know the, the so we have this you know, the other interesting thing in terms of the self and the self, you know, um, Jesus calls the voice in your head the self you have made. I think it's really important to understand that every time Jesus mentions ego in the course, he's talking about Julie and he's talking about Keith. He's talking about the voice in my head. It's not that it's not that Keith or Julie have to choose between the ego and the Holy Spirit. Um, the ego is Julie and Keith. It's that voice in my head all those opinions i am the ego <laughs> and and so you know choosing the holy spirit means not being the crazy person in the head for a minute and that means looking at the crazy person without judging them does that make sense yeah thank you very much um that that does uh, resonate so thank you yeah so so I, I i think i think you hit their nail on the head there about you know um you know, a client from the darkness out and not being judged. Because again, that's what the pamphlet says. I mean, the whole psychotherapy pamphlet, and Helen was professor of psychology, like, and uh, the whole pamphlet says, it pretty much says, anything you do in the therapy means nothing. <laughs> All that matters is that you uh, see the client as uh, not guilty and innocent. Um, and right. you don't judge. Yeah. So you could sit there reading the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the only important thing is that you forget to judge your clients that you know you have that moment of you know um, perfect joining with your client well and, and you see them in some kind of um holistic light you know like you see them as whole uh well the fact is you see that the thing is the client is whole and you are whole when we're all whole it's just there's an insane voice in our head that thinks differently um, okay, you ref so, uh, you reflect you reflect like a mirror back to them that they are already whole. Yeah, we have we have a wrong mind and we have a right mind. Um, and right. So you know, my my wrong mind is called Keith and yours is called Julie, and it's just this insane voice in our head that we are identified with, and it's an illusion; it doesn't exist. Um, and right. so, um, really, you know, um, all voices and heads are are insane. <laughs> There's no same voices and heads. All egos are the same um and so um and, and so again you know when we're practicing forgiveness in the world the important thing is that what we're not doing is making the voices real making the egos real making the bodies real so you know the way i forgive everyone in my life is by understanding they are not what their body is doing they are not what the insane voice in their head is saying and telling them to do what they are is what's in the right mind and all that's in the right mind is the love and peace of the Holy Spirit. And that's what you are, and it's what I am, and it's what all your clients are, um, and everything else is an illusion. But the problem is we think we are the illusion. <laughs> and so so really all healing is seeing what someone truly is, regardless of what the body is. Right, right. And I, and I think, and I, I, I think believe that, that, I'm sorry, I believe that we, um, like your the anxiety or emotions, you know, we feel emotions in our body. They're like a signal, and then 
we have to go up into our mind to understand how to act upon them. Yeah, like I say, yeah. I was I was absolutely it was it was an amazing thing for me to to understand how physical anxiety symptoms could be. I never yeah. really thought it could have been so 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 physical. Um, and then it it moves I, through you if you can release it. It moves through you, you know, as yeah, opposed to I, being frozen, yeah. frozen with it. I hear you. I, I, it, you know, okay. nothing, nothing moved it for me for four years, um, and and it was only it was only when I looked at it without judging it and went, "What does this have to do with the love and peace of Jesus in my mind?" And did that consistently for months. That was the only thing that shifted it for me. Nothing else, nothing else worked for me. And now, does it move more freely? Like, I don't have it. And like I say, I, thank God, I do not have that. Um, I, I do not like. I mean, because my, my I, I presume what I had was generalized anxiety disorder. I never got an official diagnosis on it, but I pretty much had that anxiety from first thing in the morning until last thing at night. Um, and no matter what I thought about it, it was just anxiety, and there was just my body was constantly tense. I had heart palpitations all day. I couldn't stop shaking my leg, and um, it was the only thing that gave me relief. And I felt like I wasn't going to explode. Um, so yeah, for four years, that's what I had, and um, I, I would have taken I would have taken um, anti-anxiety medications, um, but but I had um, when I got sick in 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 the beginning um, before the anxiety, my my optic nerve was damaged here, and so one of my pupils is much bigger than the other; it won't it won't contract even in bright sunlight. And when I took the anti-anxiety medication, it, it made me look like the Terminator with one massive oh. eye. <laughs> And one tiny eye and needless to say when you've got anxiety there's no way you're going to go around walking like that so i sort I of lived with you yeah rather than do it rather than take the medicine but um yeah n nothing clear for me but what did was looking at it and saying look, looking at it being being the non-peace looking at, at sorry being the peace looking at the non-peace understanding that the peace is what's real and the non-peace isn't so i really just aligned myself with that love and light in my mind and denied the denial of truth uh, which is the anxiety because that's my that's my ego and, and, and jesus tells us at no point in time does the ego actually exist at all so at no point does julie and keith actually exist at all it's just uh, an artificial intelligence it's um it's a uh, it's an ego script that's running in the mind and either i am you know either i'm i'm, I'm, I'm asleep as the decision maker which means i'm in the movie and I think I'm like, you know, the, the, the hero of the dream or else I am the observer, which means I go into the cinema and I observe my dream. Um, and that's just what worked for me. So, um, yeah, like I say, I just I, I, the, the sense of gratitude I have that I, that I don't have that anymore is just indescribable. Wonderful. Thank you. You're, you're a very good storyteller. You, you, uh, um, I've really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead, Matthew, you can comment or ask a question. We don't hear you at the moment. Okay, I guess his sound isn't coming through. <laughs> so if it does, we'll, we'll hear you, Matthew, but right now we don't. So anyways, so Keith, I'm so happy you came. It was great hearing your experience and to see how you really went through through a lot to get to be able to see. Yeah. Before we finish, because we're coming to a close, Thing soon. I would well, Wanaka, if you can hear me, like your, your sound is um, your sound is uh, phasing in and out, Wanaka. I'm losing you for a few seconds every second. Yeah, we we, we had... do you hear me? Um, you you cut out for quite a long time there, and I just heard you saying, "Do you hear me?" at the end. Okay. Well, I was asking whether you would like to share some. 
So I heard you saying if you Sing would that, like to share. Again, I, what, what I heard and you saying was. Just... <laughs> yeah, just and then we'll conclude soon. Okay. Did you ask me to share something I wanted to share? Was that it, Monica? Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, um, I think, um, yeah, I, I guess what I'd really like to say is that what, what practicing the course looks like, um, it's not, practicing the course is not um, love and light and miracles and unicorns and rainbows. That is not what practicing the course looks like at all. Um, this is not a course in positive thinking. It's a course in negative thinking and looking at all of your negative thinking with Jesus. And so this course is about getting into the trenches with the sewage that's in your mind and you you look at it with the light of Jesus until the light dispels it. You look at it without judging it, without calling it evil or sinful or wicked. You look at it and the light dispels it. And so I think, you know, a lot of course students, um, you know, they, 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 you know so, so they suddenly find themselves filled with rage and murderous thoughts and victimhood. And, and, and you think you're failing the course. And so you don't go anywhere near Jesus in your mind. Um, but that's how you practice the course. You know, you, we, we have this unconscious guilt um, that's in a part of our mind that we do not have access to um, uh, for separating from God, for attacking God. Um, and and, and it's, it's, going to, um, it's going to get projected out onto situations in your life. You know, cause and, refer, and, and, and effect are reversed. Um, you know, in truth, Jesus tells us cause and, cause and effect cannot be separate. That's why God's son could never have separated from him because God is first cause uh, and his son is the effect and they can't be separate. Um, we can only do it in dreams. Um, but but this whole dream is based on cause and effect being separate and cause and effect being reversed. And so the fact is you have all this unconscious mind in, in, in a part of your mind to which you do not have access. And it is going to cause you um, to have accidents and get sick. And it's going to cause people to attack you. <laughs> and it's going to cause bad things to happen in your life. Um, and so... And then because cause and effect is reversed, you will think that the bad thing happening is what's making me feel horrible and rage and hurt and pain and sorrow. And, and actually, you know, the cause and effect is reversed. It's your guilt that made that happen in the dream. And now you're experiencing your guilt in response to it. Um, so, so what I want to say is, for the love of God, if you are a serious course student, you want to be saying, woohoo every time your murderous rage comes up because that's your guilt that's that's your opportunity to do what this course is about which is to look at that without judging it with the light of jesus so you can dispel it there is no other way home there is no other way for to um undo your guilt and um, there is no other way to com complete jesus's course what you want to do is you want to start celebrating everyone that makes you feel that rage that pain, that hurt, that anxiety, when it comes up, all you do is you go up into the light with Jesus and you look at it. That's that's what doing this course looks like. It is not sunshine and rainbows and unicorns at all. It's a course in your negative thinking because when that emotion comes up inside of you, that's your guilt. That's how this course works. It's about having that murderous thoughts and guilt and fear and rage and all of that garbage. It's about having situations seem like they're causing it now they're not the garbage caused the situation because cause and effect effect are reversed but what you want to do is you want to celebrate um how 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 awful your feelings are when they come up that's how you do the course thank you for that clarification that's really helpful because because i think that you're right about something that you can be uncertain about whether whether having all these ugly thoughts and feelings and experiences 
are an indication that you're not doing the course right. Yes. No, and that's a absolutely. Good clarification. Yes, the mistake everyone makes is they think, oh my God, this means I'm a terrible course student. I'm flunking Jesus' course. No, you're not. This is what the course is. Thank God it's coming up. This is the only way it can come up. Now look at it with Jesus without judging yourself. That's how you do the course. Every time I have these crappy feelings, I want to murder someone. Great. That's your guilt coming up. Let's have a look at that with the light of Jesus in your mind. Let's undo it. Let's work on getting home. <laughs> There's no other way home except for that crap to come up and to have the light of Jesus of the Holy Spirit in your mind dispel it, provided you're looking at it until it's gone. We don't look away. You don't leave it with him and come back to him. It's you look at it. Uh, you allow it to be there. You have no resistance to it. You, you because because you don't want to. What you want to do is you don't want to take the mad idea, the tiny mad idea series all over again. You don't want to make a big deal out of it. Kenneth Wapnick always defined right mindedness as looking at your wrong mindedness without judging yourself or without making a big deal out of it. So you, you may as well understand that as course students, we're all going to be, you know, um, having these situations that appear to cause us like all these negative things. And we shouldn't be like this as course students. No, that's the course is for your negativity. This is not a course in like nice, positive statements and, you know, love and light and rainbows. This is a course for when you have the rage and the fear and the anxiety and the victimhood. This is the course for looking at that with Jesus. That's what this course is. It's not about... It's not about choosing the light. It's not about focusing on the light. It's a card of focusing on the darkness that it can be dispelled. It's it's a course in the negative, not the positive. Again, it's it's a course in the removal of the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. So this is not a, a course where you want to be, you know, focusing on love's presence. It's a card where you want to focus with love in your mind on your darkness. That's what this course is about. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. So, so now I would like to thank everyone for being here, including you, Keith. My pleasure. Thank <laughs> you for Dean. having me, Wanako. And for this opportunity to get to know ourselves even more, right? Because know thyself is one of the main tenets of A Course in Miracles, even if it's not always spoken about. <laughs> that is, know thyself is the main message. For sure. <laughs> for sure. And I would. Uh, I would love to you all to review the podcast, share about it, um, get people to know about it because there's so much material here to listen to and to learn from. Yeah. And subscribe. Yeah. And yeah, once again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Keith. And thanks, Wanako. Have a good I'm night. Sure we will you're still coming in and out sound wise so till next